All right, let's do this. Welcome first time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table, especially our next incredible guest who joins us today to talk about the intersection between race and sports, mental health, leadership, equality, social injustice, and white privilege. So grab your favorite deli sandwich or bagel and your favorite beverage, and let's do this together in the Sports Deli. We are so honored to be joined today by two incredible basketball players, but even more unbelievable humans. Delana Sampton was an All-American basketball player at the University of California, San Diego, before working for Heidi Vandeveer as an assistant women's basketball coach, and Tamir Goodman, known as the Jewish Jordan, was an amazing basketball player before he went into private business as an entrepreneur and now has a world-famous basketball net that he has designed called the Aviv Net. And the two of them are joining us today here in the Sports Deli, and we are so honored to have the both of you here with us today to talk about diversity and inclusion and your journeys and we can't wait to hear all about how you got to where you are today. And Delaney, let's first start with you. You know, this isn't the first time that you protested. So tell us a little bit about that and how you're handling all of this right now. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me here um, and kind of diving into everything. You know, we had COVID and now Black Lives Matter. It's It's a movement that's kind of resurfacing. I know a lot of people are like, kind of getting rocked by it for the first time, but um, I was protesting in 2014 about this. So I remember, uh, I remember kind of the different stages. This obviously feels differently and I hope it kind of embarks more change. I know it's happening um, at UC San Diego. It's, It's taken a long time for us to kind of look in the mirror and look at some things that, uh, we can do better at. And uh, people always talk about systemic change as a, like what needs to happen and it seems so far away and so difficult but there are systems at every single level so we can help change our system right so we can affect our team we can affect our um, department we can you know make changes that rock our school um, for the better and that's really what we're looking to do so i think it's really easy to be like well we can't change it because it's so far and like everyone's like educate yourself which you absolutely should do but there's there's definitely changes that can be made um, in your communities. So we've been working towards that, putting out new proposals, policies, things like that. Uh, anything in particular that you wanted to share in terms of um, policies or change? Definitely. We've decided already. We had um, some town hall meetings and where we opened up the discussion and gave um, people the platform just to share how they're feeling. And we had it with our scholar athletes and we learned a lot from them. Uh, we're doing it with our staff. We had it with our team. And uh, from that, we've already, Earl said, our athletic director, that we're going to have more of those meetings. It's not going to be like a one-time hit. We're going to, we're scheduling more of those after finals and we are, um, putting racism and racism in America, racism in San Diego, racism, uh, just day-to-day racism on blast. And we're not going to let it, um, we're not going to kind of get off the gas. We want to make sure that we're talking about it. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but the more you talk about it, the less uncomfortable it'll be. And it's not fair for it to just be uncomfortable for our black scholar athletes, our black staff, our black faculty. It's not fair. So I think that everyone's seen that and we're making changes um, definitely in that way. Groups, group wise, um, as leaders in this community, um, it's really important that we support those black scholar athletes and we're looking for new ways to do that uh, whether it's us coming together as like a black coaching staff black um, staff members who are coming together to like brainstorm things um, or having them meet up and having us be mentors we're trying to figure everything out but we're definitely making strides into bettering that because sometimes you don't see how bad things are until um until something like this sweeps it by and it's like, okay, everyone needs to do better. And we are definitely the institution that's looking to be innovative in uh, 
face it head on. Yeah, I was going to say UCSD, you have a great sell there, obviously. Um, academically, one of the top uh, institutions in the world, not just in the United States. And you have uh, someone like Heidi at the helm. Mm -hmm. And she was the first uh, coach at UCSD to sign a multi-year contract. And so with that comes uh, additional responsibilities. Uh, and she's often, uh, someone in her position is often more known than even the president. And so um, I think you make some great points. And uh, uh, I think under her guidance, um, you guys are in great hands. But the question I have is, what are you going to say to recruits um, when they, you have your normal sales pitch that says, yeah, our institution's amazing academically and we uh, are, you know, an amazing athletic program. And then they want to know how things now, because of Black Lives Matter, are going to be on the campus in the dorms and in the residence halls and, yeah. you know, what, what, people are doing uh, to, to fight for, you know, uh, all rights, but it, it, in particular right now, Black Lives Matter, um, you know, and how are you going to address that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, you kind of mentioned Heidi, and Heidi's been amazing throughout this. Um, she is one of the most progressive people I know, um, and she is just been on it, educating herself and meeting with people individually and really trying to do a better job at making sure she understands what's going on, uh, addressing things within herself. She, I love Heidi. I've always loved working for her. I appreciate um, all the insight she gives me and she's been coming to me and asking me questions and it's just been such a open and loving environment from um, her, which I can ask for a better leader in that way. And uh, when it comes to recruiting, we've always been transparent. We're a very honest program. We uh, try to do things the right way. We're not going to try to sell you something that's not there. So uh, UC San Diego is a wonderful school, and it's going to get better from this. It's not going to take strides backwards. It's going to address problems. And we've always kind of prided ourselves on being a school that is innovative and is above, ahead of the curve and um we're looking to still do that here. We don't want it to just be a, something that we did in June. It needs to be something that changes our entire system. Like I was talking about, it's super important that we grab it, you know, grab the bull by the horns and we figure out the right way to steer it because this is not a problem that's just going to go away if we don't talk about it and if we don't address it. So I um, look forward to talking to recruits more about it. I look forward to telling them that, this is a safe space for them, uh, no matter what race they are, where no matter where they come from, because that's what UC San Diego has to be. That's why that's why I coach because I love our players and I love the program. So it has to be that um, in order for us to be honest and transparent, like we are. You know, there's going to be some people that are going to be on one side, just like recruits, and you got no shot at them. And there's going to be some people that are going to be on your side right away. And then there's going to be some people that are going to be in the middle in that gray area. And those are the ones that we need to target at least first and educate and uh, get them to understand why this is such a, a big white problem. Yeah. Because we, we've had a 400 year head start and nobody can catch up <laughs> in a week. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to explain even that concept because you don't want people to think that, you know, that it means that they cheated. And I think that's what white people sometimes see is like, oh, well, you're just blaming this and this and this. I had these opportunities, but I still worked hard. And no one's t saying that you didn't work hard. And no one's saying that, you know, what you put in wasn't there was less than anyone else's. It's just that you had a head start. Or the way I kind of like to say it, so it's a little bit it's a little bit different. I don't see it as necessarily a head start. I just like to say that they got to start at the starting line and we were a few miles back, maybe five, you know? So it's not that we're asking for handouts. I think that's huge in white privilege. It's not that black people are asking for handouts at all. It's that we're asking for a spot at the starting line. Um, and I think that's an easier way to see it than you got to start ahead. It's like, no, you started where you're supposed to. We started behind. Yeah. 
And you've, you know, uh, as an African American woman, like you said, you protested protested in 2014, and uh, you've been, you know, uh, present on this issue for a long time, longer than most probably. But, uh, um, and that's to be applauded, uh, certainly. But what 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 else uh, do you want to share with everyone, with America, with the world? That um, you know, you're you're a you're an incredible person. Uh, I've known you for a number of years, and uh, you're you've always been incredibly thoughtful uh, and cerebral, and um, an advocate uh, for the right things. And you know, if you so choose to be in this business, you, you're going to be successful for a very long time. People are going to look up to you like they look up to Heidi. And um, I'm just curious, sports being a microcosm yeah. uh, of of our society, and as uh, a couple of the coaches mentioned earlier, uh, if we could just use that as an example of how to shape society. I think you would agree that that's a great example, even if we have disagreements, even if there's yeah. uh, mistakes like Drew Brees made, uh, you know, Drew Brees made a horrendous mistake and, and he's admitted it. Um, yep. It was a dumb thing to say, but he's really not the problem because he's in the middle at the very least. He's not, you know, on the side of, uh, as my, as I mentioned earlier today, um, when I talked about how, uh, the Obama, the Obama administration uh, scared white people, and the Trump administration brought out the real whites. Yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And and uh, how do we go about? Um, it's probably a multi-layered issue and question, but how do we go about, you know, creating change so that it it resembles sport? Yeah. Man, I think that it starts in so many forms with us understanding that, you know, basketball can be taken at any moment. I think COVID showed us that, right? Basketball was taken from us. Um, and it's going to bring, like, when we come back, it's going to have a new level of appreciation. I think we're going to see better basketball. People are going to be caring more. And then with this aspect, with the Black Lives Matter and it for, with it being on the forefront and having athletes speak up and, um, that wasn't always the case. Like we've had Michael Jordan, incredible black athlete, didn't mention being black very often when he was at the peak of his fame. Um, people used to be scared to do it. It wasn't something that you could do openly. You had finally found your kind of seat at the table and it wasn't like, I'm going to parade my blackness around. Um, well, unfortunately, Tiger Woods for that matter. Tiger Woods, exactly. Yeah. Um, and now we have different voices out there. And, you know, after the whole shut up and dribble incident, um, yeah. yeah whoa it i think that pushed more athletes to speak up and this has been such an extraordinary um movement because i've seen so many different people get involved and athletes using their voices and kind of going back to the idea it's like we are scholar athletes my scholar athletes are going to be the ones building our world um in a few years and they're coming out and they have something important to say they have different perspective they work extremely hard and they still have something where it's like no matter how hard i work if we don't do make this change then i'm only going to get so far and that's something that people don't comprehend because everyone thinks that hard work equals success and in a lot of ways it does if you work really hard at basketball you'll probably make more free throws you'll probably um, develop different parts of your game but if you never have the the stage to show them off because you're not allowed access to that um arena, then hard work didn't equal success in that point, right? Hard work equals success when it's mixed with opportunity and access. And um, I think our like our top of the line athletes right now who are speaking out about it, I mean, we have some incredible athletes, like I said, like Maya Moore is speaking out. Um, Lisa Leslie has spoken out. We have, and those are some female rock stars who are talking obviously lebron james is talking we have Dwayne wade talking and there's some really famous black athletes who are coming out and showing that they're more than just athletes showing that this is an important place to be and asking for everyone else's seat at the table and that is critical in order for us to see change so i know that um america has had a gap with sports being missing and i'm and i'm 
hoping and praying that it's filled with more talk and more um, questions, not just about what they did in the game, but what they're doing to change the world. Because I think that's incredible and important and basketball can do that. It opens doors and gives people opportunities. So it's a great question, Mike. Uh, well, I, I hear the, the passion in your voice and, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, been years and years and generations of um, uh, oppression and frustration and anger. And, uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, I think. I think there is hope uh, once you peel back some of these layers and, and unlearn and educate. Yes. And start to be proactive and, and be a part of the solution. Otherwise, you are certainly a part of the problem. Yeah, it's so important, I think, what you said there, because racism isn't, I don't, racism isn't in every person when they're born. It's a taught behavior. So you have to try to unlearn it. Not, It's not like things like algebra that you can just like go a summer and forget about because you're not learning, seeing it every day. You are still seeing racist images every single day on the media, in your music, in your news. So it's, you have to physically and mentally choose to unlearn it and look for it. And that's why education is so important about this because it's not, um, I'm, I'm reading the book White Fragility as well. I actually have it with me right here. It's not that every racist person is a bad person. And I say that with a grain of salt because it's hard to even get those words out because you put racism and bad right next to each other. But a lot of the times people who are racist don't even realize they're doing it. And that's why black people go back and forth between like putting it in your face and pulling it back because it's like, we, I love some people who are racist. I love them. I want them to be better. And I want them to see that they're doing it. But um, it's so American to be racist that you don't realize that it's that you're doing it. So choosing to educate yourself and choosing to be someone who's part of the change and who's looking for it, you're still going to make mistakes. And when you make those mistakes, choose to forgive yourself, ask for forgiveness, and keep trying. Because it's, so, it's going to be so easy to go back into your shell. Your world does not change that much based or by um, our lives starting to matter. It doesn't change that significantly immediately to you right? It will. It'll change your children's life. It'll make them better. It'll make them better people, less violent, uh, more caring. It'll bring kind of this light to the world that it's supposed to have. But immediate changes, like you're not, it, sometimes it feels as though uh, when you're taking something away, I, I kind of have this analogy in my mind, but sometimes um, you think about t like taking something away or so you're giving something to someone else as like you're losing out on something. And this is not that. Um, in most situations, when you take something away from someone, they're losing. You know, if you have a, bo a box of apples and you take four out and give them to someone, you lost four apples. But in this situation, it's not an apples. It's like you're a hole and someone's digging it, digging some things out of the hole and it makes your hole bigger. And it's like, it's getting wider and better. Mm -hmm. So don't think of it as you're losing out. It's just going to make it better, even if you don't see it at first. So, um, and sometimes you have to take people. sometimes you have to take a step backwards to take two steps forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. The loss of George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, it's like wait, the and the list goes on. I was looking at the list actually, um, because I went out and protested a few times and it was I felt so emotional because so often they're hashtag and they are the start of conversation, but it takes it can't keep taking black death for black lives to matter can't happen so um but i was looking at that and i was like man i really hope george floyd's name is the last one that has to spark or reignite this conversation i hope so because trayvon's martin trayvon martin's name it meant so much to me when i was in high school i was so sad by it yeah. um and now it's like his birthday comes along and you might see a couple of posts but it was like system, systematic change needs to occur. And I really, I pray that George Floyd's name is the one that knocks it out the park. 
Well, I think between him and, and Colin Kaepernick, I, I just don't think we're going to go backwards. Uh, Colin Kaepernick's going to go down in history as maybe not Martin Luther King or Muhammad Ali, um, but he's going to come very close. Yes. Colin Kaepernick. And I mean, talk about someone who they take your story and they try to make it something else. Colin Kaepernick is that. I was so sad and like, frustrated when I when Colin Kaepernick was um, going through everything he went through uh, with the NFL because people just weren't seeing his story. I grew up a 49ers fan and I stopped watching 49er games. I still I still don't because it broke my heart to see the way they treated him. It broke my heart to see them take what he was saying about police brutality and about the mistreatment, the prejudice um, that black men black women also, but black men go through every single day and they turned it into him hating the flag or disrespecting veterans. It's like, that's not what it is at all. Most, a lot of our family, a lot of them are veterans. We fought in the, in different wars as well. The, um, Vietnam war. And my grandpa fought there. We have, you know, they obviously fought in the civil war. It's like, we fought to shape this country as well. We just also were the slaves that built your country. So um, right. I think that Colin Kaepernick is just like, his story got so misled and I'm hoping that this steers it back to what it's supposed to be. So like you said, I, he's going to go down as one of the most um, just change-seeking athletes ever. Um, definitely going to be in the Black History books. He's going to be in the American history books, not just the black history books. I pray for that. I hope American history books change significantly. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, any uh, closing thoughts? Um, you were amazing. I love you. And um, I love listening to what, what you had to say. And that's, I think, what we all need to do is just listen. And, uh, you know, I think we can... Uh, slowly but surely get to a better place at, at, in terms of America's consciousness. And, um, and I think in 30 years, uh, just like I talked about a little bit earlier in terms of the uh, um, LGBTQ community, how it took a long time for people to even acknowledge or even see it or talk about it. And now the acceptance is um, like it's, just a normal thing and maybe this is different maybe it's not and time will tell but um uh i think that's the direction that we're headed in and uh, as anita said earlier i'm very hopeful as well that's awesome yeah i i want to thank you for opening up this platform for me to speak and you know share my passions about it because i'm so passionate about it I'm passionate about basketball and passionate about the changes that it brings as well um and I guess my closing remarks is to remember in November and to go and vote. And that's so important. Your voice matters. I think there's kind of this uh, misconception that, you know, your vote might not count because maybe California is blue or wherever you are is blue or red or whatever, but your vote matters so much. So go out there, get in, go to the polls, do some research, um, and make the changes that we want to see in the world happen because you have the power to do it. So, um, like I said, thanks so much for having me, Mike. I have loved this um, and I really appreciate you. I appreciate you as much, if not more, as uh, I learn as much, if not more from all of you than and you're going <laughs> to learn from me. That's for sure. But uh, I, I have to take ownership, um, you know, just like we all do and, and do, do our part. Um, I look forward to uh, reconvening uh, and talking about this again with all of you uh, down the road and, and don't want this just to be a, a one-time thing. We, want, we should revisit this every once in a while and see where we're at and um, you know maybe continue with the series as things progress you know, down a positive road. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I really appreciate this platform, like I said, and you know bringing out a different message than the one you hear all the time. So thank you. You're welcome. And we are now joined by Tamir Goodman uh, from Israel. We, Gordon and I have known Tamir for a long time, as well as uh, John Wexler, who's uh, um, also going to be 
with us a little later. And um, uh, Tamir played professionally in Israel. And uh, before that, he was uh, top 25 high school uh, All-American. Um, and he uh, went on to play at Towson University. And uh, probably uh, looking back on it now, more importantly, what that paved the way for him to do was uh, more of what he's doing now globally. As an entrepreneur and the inventor of the Aviv basketball net. And Gordon can probably speak to a, a few more things because uh, he worked directly with Tamir growing up when he was at the Talmudical Academy in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, but uh, first, how are you and your family doing with the, with the pandemic? And uh, how's everyone's health? Yeah, thank God we're doing well. We're happy and healthy. I think Israel in general did a, a good job. I think it's a little easier to do, do a good job here because it's such a small country. So I think there's about 8 million people in Israel. And I believe there was 280 deaths out of 8 million people. So um, obviously that's tragic. And the whole world's been very... Uh, hurt from this entire pandemic, but I think for a country, Israel's done as well as possible. That's, that's great to hear, yeah. Um, Gord, do you have anything that you wanna share about uh, your experiences with here? Well, I, uh... I mean, I think, you know, thinking about this as sort of the lead up, Mike, and I know you talked about some things you wanted to ask him, and I certainly, I don't wanna, you know, step on your toes, but I think if we get to the answers, you probably don't care where the questions come from, but. I think Tamir, as I kind of look back on um, what what you have come and and where you started and what the path has been like, I really feel like the best way to describe you is is as you sort of have a mastery in relationship management. That that's kind of how I think about you. And like, and I, you know, there are three. There, we have three relationships. We have the relationship with ourselves. We have the relationship with others. And we have the relationship with the things around us. And, and you have somehow managed to really um, become skilled at um, uh, managing all three of those. You want to talk a little bit about those three areas and how, you, how you've learned how to be so adept in, in relationships? Well, thank you for the kind words. I think that there's an old Jewish saying that like, if you see something in the world that you could fix, that you could make better, then God is making you see that because it's your job to fix it or make it better. God wants you to partner and, 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 and be part of bettering the world. And I think for me, I've been blessed uh, with great relationships and basketball has been really good to me in my life. And a big part of that is because of the way that I grew up. And both of you had a very big impact on that. So I got to experience something great. And I know that a lot of it came through the game of basketball and everything that comes through the game of basketball. Like, even though I don't see you guys on a daily basis, I love you so much. I do, you know, I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm looking forward to it all day long. And we just have this amazing bond and love. And it's, it's something that's amazing. I'm not sure a lot of people in the world have that. And it, it comes through the greatness of the game of basketball and the life lessons that go with the game. So I grew up in a great atmosphere and I know how much of a benefit that's been to me in my life. So wherever I travel and I go and I see an area of, wow, basketball could help this situation, help this kid, help the relationships here, or bring some type of light to whatever's going on, whether it's bridging people together or, you know, helping people feel good through the game that's kind of like, okay, this is kind of my mission in life. That's what, why I experienced what I've experienced. That's why I learned what I've learned. And hopefully I can help people through that. So I think it's just a continuation of things that you guys taught me at a young age. And, and like I said, like if I believe that if God, you know, allows you to see something that you could hopefully enhance, it's your job, everybody in their own way to, to go ahead and do that. And for us in the basketball community, that's kind of what we try to do. Can I ask him one follow up, Mike, and then you can you can I'm sure you have stuff for him. Oh, um, Tamir, of course. Um, so you had older brothers growing up, and and your older brothers also played high school basketball. They were different players, but they both played. And you also had siblings that were your 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 age, younger. 
brothers, right? So, and maybe even twins in your family, I don't really remember, but so, but, and so you're, you're all basically exposed to the same uh, modeling. So you got to see your older brothers play basketball. So did your, your um, younger brothers, but you were affected in a different way. Somehow something happened for you that didn't happen for Adi. And, and do, you, do you know what that was? Do you know what it was that, w- that was the catalyst for your uh, basketball connection when you were a child? I think it has to do with, with loving the game. You know, there's people that love the game and then there's people that love the game, you know. And I specifically remember playing with Chen and Ruven. Chen's five years older than me. My other brother, Ruven, seven years older than me. And they beat me. And I came into the kitchen and I was crying. And they told my mom, they're like, tell him to just chill out. It's just a game and we're older than him. And I looked at my mother and I said, you know what, but it's not just a game for me. It means more than just a game. I I love this game. And uh, I think that's what it boils down to. How much do you love the game? How much uh, do you want basketball to be a part of your life? And then it's a matter of working hard and and finding the right mentors and being in the right situations. And, And for me, that worked out really well. Thank God. You know, my father passed, I was thinking about this the other day, my father passed away, I guess, eight years ago now, but I have, I've been blessed with so many amazing fathers in my life. They, even though they're not biological fathers, but I've had so many just great mentors and, and father figures in my life that that's just been an, an amazing blessing for me. You know, that's just been an, a blessing for me that I appreciate every day from anew. You talk, Gordon was talking about relationships and uh, you know father figures and people that influenced you. Um, as it pertains to uh, what we're all dealing with in the middle of this pandemic, uh, which is uh, social injustice and Black Lives Matter, um, as a, a big part of your uh, life has been your relationships uh, with everyone, but in particular African Americans. And I was just curious how um all your life's lessons and um everything that uh you've experienced as a professional basketball player um you know has led you to um develop so many amazing relationships i just was interested to hear about you know some maybe unique uh stories or you know times that you've had with with people in particular of the african-american community yeah i've been blessed with amazing relationships that started at a very young age. Uh, I guess it was 19, even in Goucher College basketball camp, I guess it was 1992. Maybe you guys would remember Wendell. Um, oh, yeah. There was a, Wendell was there. He was an African-American camper, you know, and um, it just even at a young age already, I remember we were sitting down before lunch and I had a brown paper bag of lunch with my lunch in it. And uh, he said to me, why aren't you eating lunch with with everybody else? Uh, I guess lunch was catered or there was the cafeteria or, you know, why do you have your own brown bag, your own food? And I just looked at him, I smiled and I was like, I'm just have to keep kosher. I, I just eat kosher food. So it, it's, you know, if my parents pack me from the house, like I can't eat what everyone else is eating. And he just looked at me with like total acceptance and just say, man, that, that's really cool. You know, like just made me feel so at home, so fine with who I was and my identity. And that's kind of been how it's my whole basketball career. You know, I, I graduated high school from a predominantly African-American Christian school. I was the only Jewish kid in the entire school. I felt so welcome there. Even as a kid, I'd ride my bike to the park. I'd be the only Jewish kid there. A lot of times the only white person there. And I was, I felt at home. Um, college, like I could go on for hours telling you stories of how my teammates went out of their way, like to help me be a better Jewish athlete um, relationships, even this morning at like six o'clock in the morning, I was speaking to one of my teammates from Taos, an African American guy that's like uh, till today a brother to me. Um, throughout my entire professional career, I was fortunate enough to play seven years. There's a lot of African American players that come over to Israel and play, and these are lifelong relationships. And I know how incredible these relationships are and how beneficial they are. That it's simply not true that 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 there's some type of difference between us and there's some reason that I just can't wrap my head around it that people could justify hating someone just because uh, how they look. It, it just, it, I can't wrap my heart or brain around that. And why are people ed- being educated that way when I, I know and I lived and I live 
uh, the opposite of that. So um, I just try to hopefully be a living example and and showing that to people um, and and doing it through the platform of basketball. And hopefully by doing that, the players that I work with, the players that come to our camps, um, they'll be able to be educated in, in a healthy way, in a meaningful way, which is a way that you love and respect everybody and that everybody was created in God's image. No one person is on a higher level than another person. It just, that's, I don't believe that's the way we were created. I believe that every single person is created in their own unique way and they have their own unique journey and blessings that only they have. And they could put their input in this world and in a way that no one else can. And it's our job to respect and love and support each person um, in their journey and to never, ever judge somebody negatively. It's just, I, I, yeah. that's not our job. Yeah. I, I tell you one thing that I, that I always think about. This one rabbi said, you know, we have one mouth, uh, one nose and two eyes okay so the only reason that we have two eyes okay if you want to like improve yourself and refine yourself and and work on yourself uh, use your left eye to look at your own self and see what improvements you need but your right eye is like kind of like always look at everyone in the positive you know whoever you see judge anyone always give benefit out Always be sweet to them. Always be kind to them. Always see their uniqueness. If you have any judgment or negativity or anything, you could use your left eye to look at yourself and look at yourself and, and say, how can I better myself? But when it comes to looking at other people, uh, look at them with your right eye. And um, I was glad I learned that at a young age. Now you, you, you mentioned something pretty interesting early on in your reply, and that was the, your camp experience with Wendell and how quickly he accepted you. Right. You, you gave him this story about the food and it didn't even nobody stopped to talk about it or think anything strange about it. So I wonder, uh, when was the last time you were uncomfortable? Because it sounds like because you were so comfortable with who you were <coughs> and how you were, everybody picked up on that vibe and kind of went along with the current. Was there ever a point where you were uncomfortable around basketball, around the game, around teammates, opponents, around new situations? Uh, no, I was always very comfortable. And even if I was in situations that may have been uncomfortable, they ended up being comfortable. Um, one time when I was at Towson, we were playing against a major college basketball program. I won't mention their name, but a, a top program. And we were on the road and their student section was very, very rowdy. And they were singing a chant about my keeper. They, the student section kept on saying, where did number 22 get the hat from? And the other students would say, the rabbi, the rabbi. And uh, <laughs> they were on me the whole night. And uh, at the end of the game, Coach Jazz is like, you know, get, get changed and, and get on the bus. So, you know, we got changed. And as I was le exiting the arena to get on the bus, a lot of the rowdy fans were uh, waiting there for me. They were waiting in front of the Towson bus. So I was like, all right, I'll just try to like, I don't really want to get in a debate with anyone or anything. I'm just going to try to get on the bus. So as I was trying to get on the bus, they blocked the entrance to the bus. These guys, they wouldn't let me get on the Towson bus. So I was nervous for like a split second. Okay, I'm thinking you guys were on me the whole night. What, the game's over. It's been over now for probably about an hour. What are you, what are you doing in front of the bus? Like, what is going on here? And then it ended up being the guy who was like leading the chance. He stuck his he shook it, he took his hand, he stuck his hand out to me. He's like, you know what? On behalf of all of us here, I just want to shake your hand because even though we were on you the whole night, you never took the hat off your head. Congratulations! And uh, I shook his hand. And I got on the bus, and that was it. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> so I think we would all agree that um, you know basketball is a great vehicle. Um, to uh, bring people together and uh, that uh, it does start at home uh, in terms of uh, making a difference and then branching you know off from there and but pe pe people don't always have these great experiences and so I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to where we go from here and that we don't again put it on the back burner and I, I 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's op-ed in the Los Angeles Times, but uh, he had some interesting words about this, uh, as well as others have. But um, where, where do we go from here? Yeah, I think there needs to be like practical steps, you know, practical change. And it needs to like affect us so that this type of stuff will never happen again. You know, it's like, for example, like when my kids uh, come home for school or whatever, and they say so-and-so was mean to me or this and this happened, or even when people are mean to me or say something negative to me, like, Okay, you ex- you acknowledge it happened. Okay, someone said something negative to you. Um, we tell our kids we're sorry that happened to you, but you could flip this around and say, you know what? I know what that felt like. That really hurt me, and I want to make sure that I never make anyone else feel like that. You know, that's going to be my practical change. That's going to be like my next steps. So I think that like as the world right now and everything that we've gone through right now. We need to take all the pain and flip it into something positive and say, look, we've seen some very horrific videos. We've seen some really hurtful things and have maybe heard personally really hurtful things. How do we take that pain and flip it around to a practical step and say, you know what? I never want anyone to feel this. I never want anyone to go through this. What can I do in my own way to to make sure that everyone in my area, everyone I come to contact with feels upbeat and positive and empowered? And hopefully if everyone does that, each person in their own unique way, in their own unique area, that's going to ultimately cause a greater change in the world. I think that's what needs to be done. And it should be pointed out, Mike, that Tamir has a camp. He hosts in Jerusalem. Uh, many, of his, many of his friends from basketball uh, with popular names and, and famous, if you will, come and, and contribute there. And I think it's been, having been there, uh, it's a great opportunity for kids that, you know, I don't, I don't know what what's going to happen in terms of uh, travel and so forth now, but it's, it's really a fantastic camp he holds. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, just on a sort of lighter note, who, who was your biggest basketball influence growing up besides Coach Kaplan and Coach Katz? <laughs> uh, well, I've had a lot of people that have influenced me um, on, a, on a macro level, I guess, I growing up. In the 90s, we were all infatuated with Michael Jordan. I know not everyone likes to hear that, but we lived with Michael Jordan. I lived with Michael Jordan. Um, I tell the kids nowadays, like, we didn't, you know, we didn't really have, you couldn't just watch the, the, the replay as many times as you wanted. Like, okay, the next morning you watch it on Sports Center. Sports Center was 30 minutes. They might, you might watch the, you know, basketball. You might get like a minute clip, right? So you really had to watch the game put it in your mind and in your heart. What did you just see? And then go back out on the court and, and live it. You had to relive it in your mind over and over again. And I think it became a part of you. You know, you became one with these players on a macro level because nowadays the kids can watch any move they want over and over and over again until they master it. Whereas we had to live it. We had to live it in our mind and heart. Like I remember, you know, against the Lakers, Jordan, like going up with the right hand and then switching to the left. Like you saw it, you saw it once. You may see it again, but you got to go down to the court now and and, and relive it. So in that way, it became, we lived it, it was within us. But then on a micro level, obviously I had Coach Kaplan and everyone and Coach Katz and everyone in the Baltimore area. Um, I don't know if you remember Gerard. Obviously, you guys remember Gerard Garlic um, was a hero of mine growing up. And um, it was just so great that he would come with us at TA. Um, another local guy his name was Ronnie Murphy I don't know if you guys remember he played for the Portland Trailblazers and um, you know when I'm like 15 16 this guy was playing behind Clyde Drexler he I know he had dropped 37 on North Carolina at North Carolina and then like you know when he started like training me or working out with me and playing with me like just getting a little bit of confidence and some mentoring from from local people that that really made me feel uh as hopefully as confident as possible. And then I really had a, I really needed to get stronger. That was a really big uh, part part of my journey and meeting a coach named Rob Slade. He runs a place called Sword Speed and Strength Athletic Club in Baltimore, getting stronger with him, getting more explosive. He had a really big impact on me. Um, 
you know, I just say that I grew up in the right place at the right time I, because I, I was just embraced by the perfect family and, and, and the perfect extended family. And uh, there's really too many people to mention, but I, I credit it and love all of them because there's no way I would have been able to live out my dream if, if it wasn't for them. I, I just can't imagine if I grew up somewhere else underneath different circumstances, my life would have, I, w- I would have been able to accomplish what, what uh, I would have been able to live out and dream the way I've been able to live out my dream. Well, you may have may have looked up to Gerard, but you played more like Dave. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I love social media and that I'm in touch with him and he just, boy, he was special. You know, just, just the whole, all those days at, at, at Goucher back then of, you know, I think about it now all the time, even today, it's like going to Goucher College basketball camp was incredible because you're 9, 10, 11, 12 years old and you're learning the game at such a high level. Like you're learning, like I totally remember being in a film session with uh, Gerard and, and, and all those guys, like they were like talking about, you know, help side defense. And I'm like nine years old. And one I <laughs> clearly remember it was like a side room off near the new gym, near coach's office. And they were like nagging on each other because someone wasn't in help side and they got burnt and they caught a layup. And they were like, to them, that was like unacceptable amongst the team. And they weren't talking about breaking someone's ankles. They weren't talking about, you know, I don't even know what. They were talking about, like, very high-level basketball, and they were so passionate about it. So growing up, you know, in a camp where you, like, you learn that type of stuff and in that type of positive environment, it's a huge advantage. And p- parents call me now all the time, what should we do with our son? What should we do with our son? And the first thing I tell them is try to find a local college in your area that might be running a basketball program at a high level because – that's probably like the greatest thing you could give your child as far as like advancing their game right now. If it's, if it's a good program and Goucher for us was, it's amazing. And then going to the games and it had a community atmosphere. I remember shooting the free throws at the timeouts and the student section really loved the basketball team, being able to get a couple shots up on the court after the games, you know, just growing up like that was more than a dream come true. It was, it was really, really special. Yeah, it really impacted my life forever. And, and you guys were a big part of that, like I said at the beginning of this. That's awesome. Uh, Gordon, any uh, final thoughts? Well, I mean, I, you know, I think Tamir leads a life that people should look up to and uh, uh, emulate. He's done a fabulous job in, in modeling really how you get all of the juice of life out of the skin. Um, there, there isn't, you know, there isn't much left in there, but but some pulp when Tamir's done with his living. And, you know, I think if, uh, if more people kind of embraced, you know, you know what, what, what he does and how he does it and the way he both gives and takes it from basketball with basketball and those around it, um, we just have a, a much nicer world to live in. Well, yeah, we appreciate uh, your time. Uh, do you have any final words, whether it's regarding uh, the state of the NBA or, your own final thoughts about <laughs> the world today or just you know anything that, that you want to share with us before we go yeah well first of all thank you for thinking of me my one thought on the nba is if they do bring it back i just hope that they give the guys enough time to get in really really good shape before they actually play a game because god forbid it's just so much easier to get hurt Definitely. when you've been off for that long um but as far as this discussion and everything to me, it's all about relationships. There's a TED Talk. You could Google it. It's from uh, someone that did a Harvard study on what makes someone happy. And the bottom line is relationships. They study people with the same exact disease, same exact age, same exact everything. But patients that have had great relationships around them, they were able to recover quick, quickly and feel better, even though they were both treated with the same medicine. So it shows that like you want to be happy in life. It's it's a big part of it is having great relationships. I've had great relationships. and. I love you guys for that. And I, my blessing to everyone is that everyone should be surrounded with great relationships, people that love them unconditionally. And I think that will help uh, the world in general just you know, be a happier and, and more meaningful place. Even if you disagree. Even if you could disagree, <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Well, we really appreciate you taking time out and, and joining us for our, uh, uh, our second ever podcast. and. Uh, and looking forward to our other guests uh, for this 
offer, and uh, we look forward to maybe talking to you down the road if you'd like to come back. Thank you. I love you guys. It's been great to see you, and and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Love Bye you too. Talk. Thank you. All right. Take care, Tamir. Be well. Love you guys. Thanks. Thanks for sharing space with us today. We we truly hoped you enjoyed that amazing interview. Remember, everyone, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. Contact your local and state politicians for any inequalities for any individual or any group that's being marginalized. Also, everyone, we want to raise awareness for those individuals that are currently imprisoned for nonviolent offenses, in particular those with long-term sentences that are disproportionate in particular to those people in the black and brown community. And I want to send a shout out to 40tons.co. 40 Tons is a socially conscious cannabis brand. And they're a social enterprise using the regulated cannabis industry to fight injustice, in particular for cannabis prisoners. So check them out again at 40, the number four, the number zero, tons, plural, 40tons.co because what they're doing in the cannabis space and being a socially conscious company is truly incredible and uh, they have my full support. And also wanted to remind all of you, if you're having a tough time, you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline and that number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255. And they are available 24-7, 365 days a year. You can also always check me out on Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok. At Mike Hootner. Thanks again to our amazing sponsors. Breaking Tea, Sport RX, PSK Collective, City Lokes, and Moolah Kicks. Which you can see right here up on the screen. You can search them online. At BreakingTea.com, SportRx.com, PSKCollective.com, MoolahKicks.com, and CityLokes.com. And if you'd like to support us at the Sports Deli, we'd love to have you either make a one-time donation or feel free to make a donation monthly, either $0.99 a month, $4.99 a month, or $9.99 a month. If you have uh, questions about that, Send me an email again to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and I will send you the link on how you can do that. Uh, You can also find it at the bottom of every podcast on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts. Link at the bottom to support the show. Please check out our website at thesportsdelipodcast.com. Make sure that we continue the conversations with regards to three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums, especially people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses. So those things need to change. And remember, gents and ladies, please remember to do your monthly self-breast examinations. And remember, guys, this afflicts about 1,500 men annually with about a third of those resulting in death. So we want to make sure that we do our monthly self-breast examinations, both men and women. And guys, remember to do your self-testicular examinations every month as well. Until next time, remember it takes a village. For Dr. J and Coach K, I'm Hootie Hoot. This has been a production of Hootie Hoot Productions. Thank you for joining us in the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. Remember it takes a village. Much love, everybody. Peace.